Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Chanel van der Medve, um, and today I'm very honored to introduce our guest, uh, Professor John Joseph. Um, John E. Joseph is a professor of applied linguistics in the University of Edinburgh. His books include Eloquence in Power, 1987, Language and Identity, 2004, Language and Politics, 2006, um, Sassure, um, which Anissa just described as obscenely amazing, 2012, and Language, Mind and Body, a Conceptual History, 2018. Uh, recently, Professor Joseph contributed a preface to Integrationism and Philosophies of Language in the Global South and Global North, edited by um, Marconi, Caper and Verity, currently in press. Professor Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, this... um, the brief from Sinfri for my talk was to discuss the book. I won't go through it chapter by chapter, but we'll explain what it's trying to do, then focus on aspects that are particularly relevant to this forum. I work in a school of philosophy, psychology, and language sciences that's been one of the centers for what's known as 4E cognition. Unfortunately, the terminology isn't used anything like consistently. The key thing is that five basic approaches to locating language are current in the literature. Sorry. Uh, oh, nope. Why is this not? There we are. Okay. So, uh, first, that language is in the brain, intracranialism. Second, language is in the neuromuscular system with the brain as its center. That's uh, extended cognition, internally extended. C, language extends not just through the neuromuscular system, but to devices beyond the body that are as available and reliable as internal cognition is, and that we can call externally extended cognition. D, that language extends beyond the individual to include other people. Uh, that's called distributed cognition, but sometimes is called extended uh, cognition, which doesn't help matters. It's also uh, related to what's called situated cognition. And finally, that language has no location because it lacks extension in space. Um, approaches B to E share a determination to move beyond conceiving knowledge of language as a collection of representations stored in some module of the mind or location within the brain. It seems clear enough that what we call having or not having, knowing or not knowing a particular language involves something physical in us, given that a stroke or other damage to the nervous system can make us lose it. There are certain regular correlations observable across individuals and languages between damage to a particular part of the brain and loss or weakening of particular structures of functions. These have been known since the 19th century. But as the appropriately named David Brain has put it, uh, intracranialism leads to abstraction away from physical reality when it proceeds, and this is the quote at the bottom there, as if one can assume that it's possible to consider language separately from speech and the hearing of speech, sight separately from eye and head movement and exploratory activity and the brain and nervous system is operating without interdependence on other systems within the body. For my colleagues in philosophy, including until recently Andy Clark, extended mind meant getting cognition out of just the brain to extend through the whole nervous system, which is to say the whole body and possibly outward to devices which are used seamlessly with bodily cognition. Now, the classic example there is not the smartphone, uh, it's the blind person's white cane, which we all, you already find in Descartes. Within linguistics, embodied cognition was strongly associated with Lakoff and Johnson's work on metaphors we live by, and to a lesser extent with Wierzbicka's theory of semantic primes. Some linguists and psychologists were also pursuing work on synesthesia, which they sometimes cast as falling into this vein. There was a scattering of papers exploring how extended mind in the philosopher's sense could be applied to knowledge of language, but nothing that had really made a splash. 
when extended mind philosophers talked about language, they, and I'm thinking particularly of Andy Clark, they treated it as something given, just there, which they could use to account for distributed cognition, knowledge conceived not as something stored in an individual, but created and recreated in interaction. Some of these philosophers were also tracing the historical lineage of these ideas, but again, with any consideration of the role of language absent or at least marginalized. So my book sets out first to show linguists, both theoretical and applied, what might be gained from rethinking knowledge of language in a 4E perspective, building on work already done and also establishing the venerable pedigree of this perspective. Well, not always venerable because the long tradition of tying the shape of languages to the bodies of their speakers has played a significant role in the development of pseudoscientific racism. Work cast in a superficially scientific vein and aimed at establishing the basis of racial differences. Understanding how it was possible for linguistics to play a role in this is a vitally important historical task because it's not clear that linguistics has entirely washed its hands of this legacy. Some will say that it's quite clear that it has not. It did not start out that way uh, in the translation of the opening of Aristotle's On Interpretation. Uh, there I've put additions drawn from other texts by Aristotle in square brackets. Basically what he says is, what's in the unarticulated voice uttered by humans and animals symbolizes the passions of the psyche, the psyche, the mind, it can be translated as mind, the soul. Uh, those passions include passion in the usual sense, gentleness, fear, pity, courage, joy, loving and hating, in all of which the body too is involved. Articulated words symbolize what is in the unarticulated voice. Just as articulated speech is not the same for all people, Neither are unarticulated voices the same, but what these things are primarily the signs of, the passions of the mind soul, are indeed the same for all people. Likewise, the objects which provoke the passions and which therefore the latter are images of, they too are the same. Now, Aristotle implies that articulated words developed out of unarticulated speech but doesn't speculate on how it happened. A generation later, Epicurus makes breath the cornerstone of a significantly different account of language from Aristotle's, not directly contradicting him on most points, but drawing out possible readings of his texts on language. And this is Epicurus. And so names to, and by names he means words, all language, and so names to were not at first deliberately given to things, but men's natures, according to their different nationalities, had their own peculiar feelings and received their peculiar impressions. And so each in their own way emitted air formed into shape by each of these feelings and impressions, according to the differences made in the different nations by the places of their abode as well. So emitting air, breath, spirit, differing, by the feelings and sensory impressions peculiar to each ethnos. This answers a big question Aristotle left tacit. Why do different languages exist if people have the same feelings, the same <clears throat> mental experience, and, um, and, and uh, which get uh, um, uh, universally signified in language? Why do different languages exist? Um, when, uh, on one point, Epicurus does directly contradict Aristotle when he says that pathé, feelings or passions, and phantasmata, impressions or images, when he says that they differ ethnically, this cannot be reconciled with Aristotle's belief that what he called the pathémata, passions of the mind soul, are the same for all. Epicurus offers a dramatic increase in explanatory power, how, why there are different languages, where they, what has shaped them. Um, he offers a framework for understanding languages as direct expressions of the national or racial soul 
rather than merely different ways of encoding thoughts that are universally human. That seems like a lot of benefit at little cost, but at stake is the conception of a common humanity. Epicurus lays out what will be enduring themes in the bodily approach to language outside the medical context, the central place of breath and the organs that produce it, the effect of racial difference, temperament and complexion, the roles of innate nature and environmental experience, compulsive action, uh, and, uh, and later reason choice. But the Christian and Islamic Middle Ages will forget Epicurus for over a thousand years. When they, when they say the philosopher, they simply mean Aristotle. And for Aristotle, language is both mental and bodily, but without the body being conceived of ethnic. Over these long centuries, distinct theories of mind developed in medicine, philosophy, and theology, insofar as philosophy and theology could be separated. Theologians got very worked up over how it is that beings without bodies can speak as they're represented as doing in the sacred texts. Angels were a particular worry. Um, hearing prayers when they have no ears, choirs of them singing when they have no throats or lungs. Medieval theologians weren't ready to accept any fantastic construct on the grounds that God is omnipotent. The universe needed to be coherent. Um, outside the monasteries and mosques and later the universities, religion wasn't separate from medicine. And in every town, street vendors sold oblies, iron cooked wafers on which to write Latin charms. Eating the Latin, taking the sacred language into the body um, would bring healing. Or you might write it or have it written on a strip of cloth or paper and either eat that or lay it atop a, womb, a wound or a tumor. That's embodied language at work. And we find a very bodily representation of grammar in the poem Labyrinthus uh, by Eberhard the German, a contemporary of Thomas Aquinas, with lactating lady grammar, uh, her breasts, quote, full of milk, from which the future magister, master, teacher, uh, from which uh, the future magister suckles all grammatical knowledge. The magister Im uh, imprints an a on his mind while sucking the first breast. The entire grammatical herd is summoned and follows each in its proper place. He sucks out how many types of syllables there are, how many are the parts of speech which create each gender. He sucks out which parts are located in the anterior brain and which in the posterior. He drinks from the remaining breast which offers even greater nourishment through what meaning each word may take a bribe. The reference to the anterior and posterior brains evokes the conception of knowledge found both in Augustine and centuries later in the great Persian medical authorities, Razes, Aliabas, and Avicenna. Um, Dante too will bring in the wet nurse, but he doesn't fail to notice that unlike lactating lady grammar, it's not Latin uh, that she speaks, but the vernacular which he says we learn without any formal instruction by imitating our nurses. It's been argued that print culture contributed to the disembodying of language and mind by removing language from direct bodily representation in handwriting. Maybe um, we should be skeptical of such historically deterministic explanation when it isn't corroborated by contemporary testimony. And I haven't seen that the testimony adduced, but printing did allow for wider circulation of ancient texts and the writings of Epicurus and the Epicurean Lucretius provided an intellectual pedigree for Renaissance empiricism. Empirical knowledge is acquired bodily by the senses as opposed to being implanted by God or transmitted through quasi angelic communication uh, the, the revival of Epicureanism began with Lorenzo Valla's uh, De Voluptate, 1431, and the ancient tension which we saw in Aristotle and Epicurus then gets played out again 
um, in the 17th century debate between Descartes and the neo-epicurean Gassendi, who uh, uh, they address each other semi-facetiously as O oh flesh and O oh mind. In his objection, uh, objections to Descartes' meditations, which are included in the published uh, versions of the meditations, Gassendi argues that the bodily senses suffice to account for all the knowledge a person has, up to and including the idea of God. The passages of the meditations which most excited or upset readers include the statement that, quote, my essence consists solely in the fact that I am a thinking thing. I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. Although the definition of a human being as race cogitans, a thinking thing, was traditional, Descartes' use of it <clears throat> captured attention to such an extent that other passages in his book were overlooked. For instance, the bottom one there, nature also teaches me by these sensations of pain, hunger, thirst, uh, and so on, that I am not merely present in my body as a sailor is present in a ship, but that I am very closely joined and as it were in intermingled with it so that I and the body form a unit. His last major work of uh, pa the Passions of the mind, the soul, um, uh, like um, Greek uh, psuche can be translated either way. Uh, here he maintains that, quote, the soul is really joined to the whole body and that we cannot properly say that it exists in any one part to the exclusion of the others. Um, it, it's sometimes said that he located the soul in the pineal uh, gland within the brain, but actually when you read it, he uh, says that the pineal gland sort of draws, draws it together from the whole body. Uh, Baker and Morris argue that the supposedly Cartesian co concept of disembodied mind that became the core of philosophical debate for the next 300 years doesn't accurately uh, re represent Descartes' view. They call it the Cartesian legend. The account of language in Passions, uh, Passion de l'âme doesn't divide the mental from the bodily any more than Aristotle does. When I will something, this causes a particular movement of the pineal gland, pushing some of the animal spirits it contains, that's the uh, term that was used in time, pushes some of the animal spirits into the pores of the brain. Imagination operates through these animal spirits, opening the brain pours in such a way as to represent the thing imagined and memories activated by the spirits going to the same brain pores where they were when the thing remembered was previously represented and where they've left traces. Across the channel, the idea of associationism would be sketched out by Hobbes and Locke before being fully developed in the mid 18th century by Hartley. In Hartley's theory, all knowledge is acquired and retained as vibrations in the nervous system. The example he gives is a uh, cross sensory one. Uh, he says, for this is fact, a child has the idea of the sound nurse often presented to the ear. You see that nurses figure in this quite a bit. Um, at the same time with the visible appearance of the nurse herself in the eye, and by this frequent conjunction, it comes to pass that the visible appearance of the nurse shall itself excite a faint image of the sound nurse in the ear. And the sound nurse in like manner shall excite a faint image of the visible appearance of the nurse in the eye. And all this seems to be affected by the mutual influence which the motions in the optic and auditory nerves constituting seeing and hearing have upon one another according to the laws of matter and motion. This is also the time of Newton, those coming in as well. Hartley's faint image of the sound nurse in the ear is akin to what in the Middle Ages was called the verbum cordis, the, uh, the Hartley word, funnily enough, and in more recent times called inner speech. Hartley's contemporaries saw the potential of his theory for explaining differences in racial sensibilities and national differences in culture and thought that were continuous with language differences. Like Epicurus, Montesquieu doesn't try to separate 
intrinsic ethnic difference from the effect of environment. His essay reasons that a hot or cold climate has a direct physical effect on the nerve endings, which can account for national minds. This will have echoes in, uh, uh, in literature as well. Jane Austen, her sense and sensibility, that sensibility is that nervous excitement um, that, uh, that then becomes um, central in the romantic period as well. Um, likewise, Schlegel, Herder, and Renan are among those who essentialize a Semitic versus Indo-European difference along body versus mind lines. Sometimes, as with Herder, to assert the superiority of Hebrew poetry. Uh, Renan asks, as you see here, isn't the religious and sensitive race of the Semitic peoples painted stroke by stroke in these totally physical languages? in which abstraction is unknown and metaphysics impossible. This perception of Semitic languages as physical endures. Uh, commonly cited examples still today include the fact that Hebrew uses the same word for nose and anger. Um, but English uses heart to mean courage, and courage itself derives from the word for heart. So this Orientalism is the dark side of the neo-Epicurean heritage. A question I take up in my book is how different people in Shakespeare's audience would have answered Shylock's series of questions about Jews that starts with, if you prick us, do we not bleed? And moves on then to more difficult uh, questions about diet and physical reaction to climate. Now, the common folk in the pit shared the medieval Aristotelian heritage as would most of those who paid for a seat in the stalls. But the young urbane set uh, in Shakespeare's audience, well, they, the, they were hip man to the neo-Epicureanism coming over from the continent. And they wouldn't necessarily have answered Shylock's questions in the same way as the Aristotelian hoi polloi. Epicureans might have pointed to stereotype racial differences. Aristotelians might have accepted that Jews and Christians have physical sensations and eating and violent reactions in common, but that those are also shared by dogs, which isn't the enlightened answer we want to hear either, particularly as the Merchant of Venice is filled with references to the dog Jew. By the mid 19th century, associationism uh, was no longer of central interest to philosophers in Britain, who instead were arguing over various continental theories, including uh, Comte's positivism and the eclectic Victor Cousin. But way up north in Aberdeen, and I say way up north, even in Edinburgh, Aberdeen is way up north, Bain was undertaking a scientific modernization of associationism. It treated memory as a physical phenomenon with a description that prefigures the connectionism of Rummelhart at all, I'll give a reference to that later. Um, for in Bain, currents of force pass through nervous circuits uh, and they create, quote here, specific growths in the cell junctions. The stronger the original force, the more vivid the impression left on the circuit, like the weights of connectionist analysis. After Bain, this view of linguistic knowledge as being at least partly neuromuscular was lost from sight. When Chomsky resuscitated inquiry into language and mind in the late 1950s and early 60s, it was very much in the older intracranial mode. He insisted that knowledge of language must be autonomous, separate from other modules of the mind brain, which is to say closed off from them. His argument being that a speaker's knowledge of the world is entirely detached from his or her linguistic knowledge as a native speaker. Chomsky also made it explicit that knowledge of language is a physical part of the brain, in his term, a language organ. In later work, he refers to his research program as biolinguistics and describes its aim as the, quote, discovery of the internal mechanisms that generate linguistic expressions and determine their sound and meaning, the whole system would then be regarded as one of the organs of the body. In contrast, Bain took the internal mechanisms to be spread 
through the sensory motor system, including the brain as its center, but emphasizing how much of language from learning to production and understanding cannot be reduced to purely cerebral functions. The 1970s and 80s saw applied linguistics still attempting to accommodate its models of second language acquisition to the 60s style Chomskyan version, notably in Krashen and Terrell's uh, natural approach. There was no widespread will to do otherwise, so strongly were applied linguists like their theoretical counterparts under the sway of the concept of native speaker, which was the basis of Chomsky's linguistics. Now, how do you recognize whether or not someone is a native speaker? There's a surprising lack of research on the question. My experience suggests that I and others don't need to hear someone say very much before we make the decision. Except in rare cases, a few syllables suffice, sometimes just one, in which case I'm not making the decision based on their knowledge of syntax or lexicon or morphology or even phonology, but fine grained phonetic clues. In ordinary parlance, uh, an accent, although that term accent is used to cover more than just phonetic features, which makes it too imprecise for our purposes. Phonology is the system of sounds as they exist in the mind, the systematic differences that distinguish one word or form from another. Um, phonetics is about the sounds as produced in the mouth and perceived by the ear. An accent can involve phonological differences, but it's the phonetic ones that give the first clues as to native or non-native speakerhood. The mouth and ear are obviously body parts. The mind isn't. So I usually recognize a native or non-native speaker from their speaking body. If I can see them, that may prime me for certain expectations. If the person doesn't look Chinese, I won't expect them to be a native speaker of Chinese, although there's no logical reason for them not to be. Primed by visual indices, I'll need few phonetic data to confirm or falsify my presumption, not always accurately, but powerfully. My late colleague, Alan Davis, exposed the native speaker as a myth with dangerous quasi-racist consequences for language teaching and above all testing, which was his specialized area. It's mythical because in reality, there's no clear boundary between native and non-native speakers. Some people learn a language to such a level of competence, even starting well after puberty that they're indistinguishable from native speakers. Whatever fine differences in their grammaticality judgments a psycholinguist may detect belong to the research laboratory and not to everyday life. In Davis's view, the native speaker myth sends learners the message that however strong their motivation, however great their efforts, they can never reach the ultimate goal of foreign language teaching by virtue of their birth and other conditions beyond their control. It's thus an unjustifiable form of social exclusion, which applied linguists should combat rather than reinforce. My comment about the priming effects of a person's visual appearance should make clear too why this matter is quasi racist. Though as the definition of racist broadens, the quasi may have to go. Davis's was a rare voice articulating de Merle from the Chomskyan consensus. His efforts were perhaps um, more hindered than helped uh, by the, uh, sorry, I've had a, a reference here that I've left out uh, to Pike Day, who, who wrote a book on native speaker and published it himself. Um, he made similar arguments about the quasi-racist undertones of the native speaker concept, but the book wasn't uh, taken terribly seriously. Um, during the second half of the 20th century, the idea of cognition as a process of working out algorithms done by a mind brain increasingly conceived on the model of a computer, it attained a dominance that linguistics helped to back up. The first widely spread tremor to shake this view came with work in parallel distributed processing based on an approach called connectionism. It rejected the computer model of the brain and its chains of binomial switches, replacing them with 
neural networks, still metaphorical, but approximating more closely to the known physiology of the brain. The network consists of multiply interconnected neurons um, whose connections vary in strength or weight accordingly as they're activated and reinforced by exposure to patterns following the basic principle established decades earlier by Ebb. In this way, the network is able to learn and its recursive action allows it to teach itself how to learn, to write its own learning programs as it were, with sufficient exposure to data and starting with minimal cognitive hardware. Connectionism allowed for a more central role to be allocated to environment broadly defined in a person's cognitive development than the algorithmic model of cognition. Also worth mentioning in this context is situated cognition, um, an approach with roots in the ecological psychology of Gibson and the inactivism of Maturana and Varela. It shares with distributed cognition, the impulse to move away from thinking about mind as something stored in the individual in favor of looking at how cognitive elements are constructed in particular instances by multiple actors. In applied linguistics, G has contributed significant work uh, with a situated affective dimension. The classical model of mind can only accommodate the social by turning it into a feature or image in the mind of an individual. For Freud, it's represented by the superego, but the Freudian subconscious is effectively absent from the contemporary discourse on mind and language. Distributed and situated cognition treat the individual perspective as the dominant view that needs to be resisted. Extended cognition is more about expansion of than resistance to the individual. And in that regard, it comes closer to the concerns of Pierre Bourdieu, who focused relentlessly on the problem of reconciling a belief in real agency with the fact that as agents, we nevertheless make and carry out our choices within the context and constraints of a social world. Yet it's rare to encounter Bourdieu's name in the literature on cognition, perhaps because in the Collège de France, he held the chair of sociology, although all his training was in philosophy and his research is close to ethnology. He never actually studied um, sociology. Bourdieu adopted the classical concept of the habitus, uh, a set of dispositions which incline agents to act and react in certain ways. That word habitus connected to habitare, inhabit how the world we inhabit is reflected in us. It's not to be confused with habits, involuntary reflexes conceived in a mechanical way. The dispositions of your habitus have sedimented within you through social interaction from childhood onward, becoming a physical part of your nervous system and generating practices which are regular without being governed by any rule. Bourdieu was indebted to Merleau-Ponty for his rehabilitation of the body as the support for that historical incorporation of knowledge and the contribution of the emotions to language. The habitus is inhabited by an active human agent <coughs> um, uh, who engages in exchanges of symbolic power with other agents each of whose habitus is linked to the rest in the shared field. The problem Bourdieu was addressing is how to explain the actions agents undertake that are not deliberate and the cases where they undertake a deliberate course of action but find themselves unable to achieve it because of their own strong dispositions. Bourdieu applies this form of analysis specifically to language and how the choice, quasi-choice of a particular way of speaking, quote, challenges the usual dichotomy of freedom and constraint. Uh, quote here, the choices of the habitus. For instance, referring to French here, for instance, using the received uvular instead of the rolled of Southern dialects like his own. 
uh, in the presence of legitimate speakers are dispositions which, although they're unquestionably the product of social determinisms, are also constituted outside the spheres of consciousness and constraint. The concept of native speaker, as it has figured in applied linguistics, has been grounded in the intracranial view of cognition, and specifically in the Chomskyan version, where linguistic knowledge constitutes an autonomous mental module with an innate basis. The importance of the innateness is intensified through its echo in the etymologically related native of native speaker. Both terms tie the individual's language to his or her birth. It's often pointed out that native speaker is a solicism since one is not born with a mother tongue, but learns whatever language he or she is exposed to when growing up. Despite considerable evidence from developmental psychology that, if, that fetuses are already sensitive to their mother's language in utero, a child of a Thai speaking mother given up for adoption at birth to a Cambodian speaking family doesn't grow up speaking Cambodian with a Thai accent. Within linguistic theory, the continued use of native speakers subtly strengthens the contention that an innate universal grammar defines the underlying reality of every language to the point that Chomsky maintains that there's only one human language and what we normally call languages are merely dialects of it. Any link of native speaker to birth implies a correlation with other sites of discrimination, particularly race. Now, Chomsky has always linked universal grammar with every, every child's infinite linguistic creativity in an anti-racist way. But when the context is switched to that of the language learner being assessed against the criterion of the native speaker, in colonial and post-colonial settings where the learners are of a race that suffers discrimination in various forms, some of them bound up with a perception of intellectual inferiority, then the intracranial native speaker becomes conceptually problematic. Does anything change if intracranialism is abandoned in favor of extended and distributed cognition? In exploring this, I'll focus on Bourdieu's habitus because he applied it to issues involving language to a greater degree than more recent psychologists and philosophers of extended mind have done. And he attempted a fuller reconciliation of social and individual aspects of language than distributors have so far managed. Extended distributed cognition frees us from a conception of language limited to representations stored in the brain and from a research program that simply assumes a brain born with a particular structure for storing such representations that develops in an automatic way with minimal exposure to input data. And that in turn frees us from any obligation to forget that the acquisition of our first language was a long apprenticeship, occupying nearly all our waking moments during the first three or four years of our lives. And that has continued since. In the course of this childhood apprenticeship, the knowledge we acquire becomes part not only of our memory, but of our entire nervous system, our extended mind, which is to say, part of our bodies. My first language doesn't set limits on what I'm capable of thinking or doing, but it makes some things come more easily than others. Um, it makes certain inclinations more natural while others require greater effort. To be a native speaker concerns an individual's position in the distributed cognition of language as it reflects the historical facts of his or her extended cognition or habitus, the set of dispositions, schemata of action, perception that individuals acquire and incorporate through our social experience. Thus the native speaker can be redefined without recourse to his or her linguistic competence. Instead, competence becomes a byproduct of habitus. As Bourdieu put it, the second quote there, the habitus embodied history internalized as a second nature and so forgotten as history is the active presence of the whole past of which it's the product. 
one can with greater difficulty for some people than others uh, attain later in life a competence indistinguishable from that of a native speaker without going through the whole apprenticeship which produces the native speaker's habitus. So long as the second language learner doesn't display the entire habitus that one expects as the accompaniment of native competence, he or she may remain native-like in the judgment of others, though it depends on the others with whom linguistic knowledge is distributed in a given context. My 2020 paper points to evidence that Bourdieu's work is on the rise again after a couple of decades of an ebb tide effect caused by perception that the concept of habitus is deterministic, ignoring agency in favor of structures. Um, Bourdieu himself argued over and over against this um, misperception and described his approach as, quote, refusing to reduce agents, which he considers as eminently active in acting without necessarily doing so as subjects, that is Cartesian subject, um, to simple epiphenomena of structure. Um, the notion of habitus expresses first and foremost, the rejection of a whole series of alternatives into which social science and more generally all of anthropological theory has locked itself. But he laments, quote, unfortunately people apply to my analyses and this is the principal source of misunderstanding the very alternatives that the notion of habitus is meant to exclude, those of consciousness and the unconscious, of explanation by determining causes or by causes. Alan Davis was right to insist that it cannot be an objective or neutral move for us to make the native speaker the implicit goal of language teaching and the yardstick for assessing the proficiency of a non-native speaker so long as the concept is bound up with the Chomskyan mind brain of an idealized individual in a speech community where everyone is linguistically the same, combined with the political ethical belief in native speaker equality. The intent may not be to oppress any non-native speaker, but we don't assess policies based on intentions, only on their results. The result of taking native proficiency as the implicit goal of language teaching and testing is that the effort to learn a language is doomed to failure in the sense that however good a learner you are, you will never measure up to even a speaker of the most socially stigmatized non-standard form of the target language. That's not only absurd, but self-defeating. If on the other hand, we redefine native speaker in the bodily terms of habitus, with all that it captures concerning extended cognition, at least intracorporally, does that actually help with the oppression problem? I believe it does. The reason being that habitus doesn't carry the conceptual baggage of the standard language as grammatical knowledge does, nor the link with intellect, and certainly not the lingering traces of Chomskyan universal grammar. Extended cognition implies that a language proficiency assessment <clears throat> isn't a measure of the amount of information stored in a cerebral closet, to use Bain's disdainful phrase. It measures the adaptation of a person's whole nervous system, whole sensory motor system. And distributed cognition implies that the assessment is a measure of something beyond the person being projected back into the person. It forces us to admit the artificiality of such measurement, while extended cognition as habitus likewise forces us to face the absurdity of giving a grade to a, a, a language student's embodied history. I'll end with a couple of recent developments within applied linguistics, which you are familiar with and which are pushing forward the agenda of extended and distributed cognition in language. Um, one is the conception, the concept of translanguaging uh, for Garcia, quote, when describing the language practices from the perspective of the users themselves and not simply describing bilingual language use of bilingual contact from the perspective of the language itself. The language practices of bilinguals are examples of translanguaging. Translanguagings are multiple discursive practices in which bilinguals engage in order to make sense of their bilingual worlds. Garcia's implication. Uh, Blackledge and Cree's note is that, quote, bilingual families and communities must translanguage in order to construct meaning. The concept challenges, but it doesn't contradict, the concept of 
compartmentalized language knowledges. The multilingual brain could have separate grammars, which it draws upon in its multiple discursive practices. But the very fact that multilinguals don't neatly separate their discursive practices by language is evidence that their knowledge of languages isn't compartmentalized. And that sits more comfortably with languages being embodied in habitus as well with it being distributed because translanguaging depends not on not just one person's, not one speaker's linguistic knowledge. It occurs in a context where all or at least several of the discourse participants comprehend what's said in what traditional analysis would separate into different languages. Extended cognition is used by some people to mean getting out of the skull and into the whole body, and by others to mean getting out of the body. The dis that distributed cognition isn't necessarily conceived in a bodily way, uh, and when it is, the bodies taken into consideration aren't necessarily limited to human bodies. Zoosemiotics or biosemiotics has challenged the human-animal dichotomy since at least the work of Jakob von Uxkühl in the first decade of the 20th century, and more recently post-humanist theory has extended cognition to non-living bodies in Latour's words, the parliament of things. Post-humanist applied linguistics looks at how the things talked about or included in the context but not talked about play a role in the linguistic production that transpires in a given setting, such that their role and the role of roles of speakers and hearers cannot be neatly separated into agentive and non-agentive. If something, some thing or animal in the situation compels an utterance, is it not the agentive subject under which the speaker is acting in something like a passive way or blurring object and subject roles? Zoosemiotics, well, we've come full circle. You'll recall that the story began with Aristotle describing what aspects of language are shared by humans and animals. And he also mentions the objects which provoke the passions. He's right up to date. As we pursue an understanding of what, if anything, it means to be a native speaker or to engage in translanguaging, we'll eventually have to come to grips with what, if anything, it means to be human. Maybe it doesn't mean so much as we self-obsessed humans have always thought. Thank you all for your patience. I know that not everyone finds these historical odysseys as intoxicating as I do, but I put it to you that in linguistics, the past is a second south. It's the place most linguists avoid, except for an occasional holiday to bring back souvenirs or open a mine, a data mine for nuggets that they'll use to confirm that their north, the present, represents the universal and is all that we need to attend to seriously. The end. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Joseph, for a very insightful talk. Um, Prof Professor Marconi, um, you have the floor to start the conversation. John, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but before I do that, um, I want to read uh, back to you the paragraph in um, the first paragraph, the opening paragraph in your in your chapter, Extended Distributed Cognition and the Native Speaker, was that I think captures what I am going to be talking about. You're right. Every concept, model, and technique devised by theoretical or applied linguists has its limits in terms of applicability and shelf life. It is futile to assess them simply as right or wrong. In the long run, to paraphrase Keynes, they're all dead wrong. What needs to be asked is right or wrong for what? What does the concept model or technique make it possible to do? And at what cost? Could an alternative one do it better or at less cost? I think that I think is the critical way of thinking about this. That for example, if we say the native speaker, what is it intellectually that the native speaker allows us to think about, which other terms might not? Bearing in mind that 
we will come to a phase where we need to move beyond some of these terms. Let me get back to um, issues about, let's say, translanguaging. The interesting thing, given what you're talking about, is this. Is it possible that the notion of uh, native speaker and translanguaging are incompatible? Is it possible that we now need to begin to think of the intellectual phase beyond translanguaging? Because as sure as the sun rises, there will come a time when we will forget that there was ever a discussion about translanguaging. In as much as we have forgotten that there was a phase we were all stuck up with communicative language teaching and all that. So my first question to you is, is the notion of translanguaging and the notion of native speakers, are they compatible? And then I'll move on to the second set of questions. Thanks, John. Um, it, uh, it depends which uh, universe we're uh, having this conversation in because in, uh, in, <laughs> in, in the, the universe of linguistics, the thing is that um, the, the concept of native speaker uh -huh. in linguistics uh -huh. has been shaped by um, a, a Chomskyan view that, that has had, and even, even before Chomsky too, uh -huh. structuralist view um, that had no place for multilingualism. Yes, yes. Multilingualism is uh, marginalized, swept uh -huh. under the rug. It's a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want to go there. Okay. Um, so the whole concept of native speaker is so strongly tied historically. Uh -huh to uh, a monolingual norm uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that makes, um, I think, in within linguistics, uh -huh. uh, within theoretical linguistics, it, the, the answer to your question, are uh, translanguaging and native speaker incompatible concepts? I think mm -hmm. the answer is yes, mm -hmm. they, they have to be. Uh, mm -hmm. In applied linguistics, you know, we've been more at the forefront of moving beyond that, uh, and and of course we've been at the forefront of uh, well, you uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, you you were Alan Davis's student, uh, were you not? Mm -hmm. I, I, yes, I was <laughs> indeed. Yes, uh, and and so you know. Um, how uh, uh, passionately he, mm. he, he was trying to break that whole concept down and I think mm. succeeded to, to a very large degree so that mm. within applied linguistics, um, the way that we, the way that applied linguistics is conflicted when it comes to the concept of native speaker. Mm. Uh, because on the one hand, we have this legacy from theoretical linguistics mm -hmm. that is very monolingual focused. And on the other hand, applied linguistics is by its nature multilingual mm -hmm. in focus. So, so I think there's a kind of uh, more of a cognitive dissonance than an incompatibility. Okay. Yes. The, let me continue with you on this one. The issue I think you're right is that the notion of native speaker and applied linguistics, there's a bit of an ambivalence there. Because for example, Alan Davis would keep reminding me that you can't be skeptical of um, uh, the notion of a native speaker, but still try to do research in second language acquisition. His argument was that the two don't just go hand in hand. Second language acquisition, somehow he said his argument was uh, buys into the notion of, um, of a native speaker. Then he then would argue that politically then, second language acquisition as currently practiced can only be oppressive. If for example, you can never be a first language speaker, right? you can never succeed in becoming a native speaker. So his argument would be, 
why then have in a discipline like applied linguistics an enterprise founded and predicated on an assumption that the learners can never become uh, first language speakers. Right. So in, in a way, what I'm saying is that the, the idealized norms of a native speaker, which form the basis in second language acquisition, are set up in such a way, like you rightly point out, to make the learners inevitably fail. And that's an unfair project in a way. Yes, and and yet and yet, uh, I, and I agree with everything you've just said. And yet, if it were the case that um, the native speaker of concept were um, scientifically irrefutable, uh -huh. then you know it wouldn't be easy just to say, "Oh well, it may be true, but we don't want it to be true because we consider it oppressive, so we're going to mm -hmm. throw it out." But it's not. It's not scientifically sustainable that's the mm -hmm. point how do, mm -hmm. and 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 how do we get out of it well i think yeah. that the the direction of travel yeah. in psychology yeah. and philosophy has been from you know out of the skull uh uh, uh philosophers are out of their skulls and, and <laughs> psychologists have lost their minds you know but we're um it's a getting out of the skull and into the body. That's the direction of travel they've been following. Linguistics has been slow uh -huh. to uh, get on that train. And it's, it seems that in linguistics, uh, you know, um, the turn toward things to post-humanism uh -huh. is actually happening more quickly than uh, the uh, uh, disembraining of, uh, of language and of, mm -hmm. of linguistic knowledge. But I think that if we actually think of these uh, movements together and, and think of it all as a way of uh, reconceiving mm -hmm. linguistic knowledge in a way that is not strictly mental, and mm -hmm. we uh, take account of this long tradition of uh, evidence mm -hmm. and research into the bodily aspects of mm -hmm. it, that that offers us a way out of this dilemma regarding native speaker and uh, uh, and the um, oppress oppression that it uh, mm -hmm. that it represents. Um, if if the natives if if what we call a native speaker is not tied to innate universal grammar, mm -hmm. but is tied to our experience, our history. Oh, okay. um, our history is individuals uh, instructed in interaction with other people yes, and as yeah. embodied in us uh -huh. um, and not determining what we do, certainly not mm -hmm. determining what we can or cannot do, uh -huh. but inclining us, making some things easier than others and so on. Uh -huh. Then I think that's a potential way out of this trap, mm -hmm. out uh -huh. of this dilemma. Okay. Th control. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Let me stop here because there are other questions that we can always continue. Um, Raphael, you are moderating. Yes, thank you, John Joseph, for your presentation and thank you, Makoni, for initiating the mm. discussion. Uh, I'll be moderating the Q&A session and uh, please feel free, as I noted in the chat, to write down your questions and comments there. Oh, yes. uh, I have, uh, sorry, I have one more uh, screen that I, I... Uh, I want to share just a second here. This is yeah. um, right there. It is okay. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> now I'm curious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. With that in mind, uh, I will go through the, the, the questions and comments in the chat. So uh, Singit uh, starts with a comment. Uh, very interesting to see why so-called first languages get connected with a gendered tongue. Uh, 
The pictures of nurses and breastfeeding are so telling uh, in European narratives that then went global and continue to be naturalized. And then the question uh, she asks uh, afterwards is, have you seen any signification to hands and eyes in how language is framed across time? That is, do different sign languages feature at all in these narratives? Uh, and before I uh, give back the word to you, I would just like to add a comment. Uh, it's a response by Susan to uh, Singita's questions. And uh, Susan writes, in language portrait work, embodiment of languages in repertoires do include references to all parts of the body, also hands yes. and eyes and brains and hearts. So back to Singita's question, do different sign languages feature at all in these narratives? Yes, uh, and the only uh, unfortunate thing is that our um, the records of sign languages are uh, don't go back very far. The, any detailed records of them, I mean, there's some indications uh, of a, of a sketchy nature from earlier centuries, but really you have to get up until uh, well. Is this I, I have to explain to my students. Uh, at the beginning of every semester that if they hear me say modern, I probably mean the 17th century. And if I say recent, I probably mean the late 19th century. Um, but uh, so, but absolutely the case from the time that uh, we have any indications of sign language, there the bodily semiotics uh, that's so central to sign language is, um, how it's re how it's related to the semiotics of spoken language uh, is extremely interesting, and there are uh, clear points of overlap in contact, and I think clear differences. Um, but it can be controversial to talk about that because some people who uh, work in sign language um, get nervous about talking about the differences, uh, the the unique features of sign language, uh, while other people want to celebrate them. Um, but but it's a, a hugely interesting thing, uh, aspect of this whole question for sure. And I uh, I'm I'm sorry that you know trying to plan this talk uh, to fit uh, within a 50 minute slot, I I omitted um, to make any reference to it. I should have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, include a comment or call your attention to a comment made by Miranda Anderson with a potentially relevant uh, reference related to uh, this question. And I'll move on now to ask uh, the question posed by Maya, uh, who uh, thanks for the uh, great presentation and asks, in the space of multilingual education, and certainly for those advocating for the teaching of children's first language before English or another dominant language is taught, the theories of inter interdependence of language development between different learned languages, plus of a common underlying proficiency model, are used. Could you situate the theories of interdependence of language development against the trajectory of the field that you shared with us? Uh, I'm just going to reread the question. Just, uh... hmm. Um, I, uh, yeah, I think that um, the theories of inter, uh, I, 20 years ago, I remember colleagues of mine who do second language acquisition uh, having huge arguments about whether a bilingual person has one grammar or two grammars uh, in their in their mind or in their brain, um, and uh, again because of the dominance of that Chomsky and native speaker model, they almost had to answer if they were theoretically inclined. They almost had to answer. Well, there have to be two separate grammars, um, and. To me, this seemed quite uh, a, an expensive construct. As, as Sinfri read that quote for me, you know, you have to judge a, a, a concept or a theory based on um, what it can do for you, but also on what it costs in theoretical terms. How how uh, 
expensive it is, how, how much faith it requires to, to sustain it, to keep it up in the air. And, and that idea of um, non-interdependence of language development, of, of separate language development, um, seemed to me to be uh, one of, like the, uh, the Hindenburg, you know, that Zeppelin that, that couldn't stay up, that finally uh, uh, fell, to, fell to the earth. So I think that, um, yes, the theories of interdependence of language development fits uh, much better with uh, models based on embodied or extended mind, extended language and distributed language um, than they do with the concepts that are still dominant in linguistics. Uh, that are based on the idea of a native speaker with a knowledge of language that's completely intracranial. I, I hope that's addressed the question. And then there is uh, an intervention by Busi Makoni. Uh, if experiences matter, can we then say that you are a native speaker of a gendered variety of the language you speak? Well, I, I'm trying to get away from native, uh, <laughs> but I know what you mean. Um, so are there gendered varieties? I mean, should we talk about women's English and men's and women's English? Is that the kind of thing you mean, Lucy? I don't know about English, but I know that uh, in uh, in, Gwini languages, they are parts of, well, they are gendered varieties, like uh, women's language of respect or Isishonipo, which is a woman, woman, women's variety, which women use to show respect. And as you transition into speaking other languages, I find personally from experience that it sometimes constrains what you can say even in English. Um, I would say that uh, this is a uh, uh, difficult territory these days because um, when I was growing up, you know, uh, I, I, where I grew up, the situation I grew up in, there were quite separate cultures of men and women. and. And there were language differences that are very clear. And I think on the one hand, um, those cultural differences have uh, shifted. Uh, and uh, uh, again, as, as I was saying before, uh, with um, people talking about sign language, um, taking very strong stands either uh, in favor of the differences with spoken languages or against there being any differences in spoken languages. I, I think it's a similar situation now when we talk about language and gender. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm reluctant to get into this off the cuff without thinking about it um, quite hard first. Uh, but insofar as you know, you're, you have experienced yourself these differences in language, does it make more sense to think of them as being something that connects to intracranial knowledge or to um, embodied experience, something like habitus? I would say absolutely the latter. So yeah, I mean, I think there's a story to be told there as well. Uh, about um, not just gender differences, but all sorts of, any sort of difference that can be related to experience and to culture in terms of body, the body and the nervous, the, the entire nervous system. And that that's opens up the potential for a much richer account. Mm -hmm. And Celeste Kinger, I see a message from Celeste Kinger 
whom I've known since we were children. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, John. It's so great to see you. <laughs> so <happy> to <laughs> and uh, and thank you. And yes, Vygotsky is somebody else who figures in my book uh, quite prominently with references to uh, uh, to to uh, Lantolf and others mm. as well. I uh, the first time I heard of Bourdieu was in the Jimenez Hall. Um, was that right? I met Loretta Clow, your student. Yeah. Here translating um, <laughs> the, the great work. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, a, a student of mine translated a book by uh, Pierre Bourdieu and she went to see him in Paris with a long list of words. She was worried about translating them correctly from French into English. And so she sat down with her list and, and went through and he said, I don't care, what does it matter? You just do it. John, can you could you comment a yes. bit further about the resurgence of Bourdieu in you know in your view? Um, I am well, aware that there's been uh -huh. a, a, a sort of people have generally generally turned away from him for the reasons that you mentioned, and I wonder if you could give us a sense of the how you see the historical context for uh, you know a, a resurgence of interest. Um, yeah. I, I, um, there's a very interesting article uh, that uh, uh, David Cram from Oxford wrote, I, I think it was 2007 uh, in Historiography of Linguistica about ebb tides in um, the history of not, not just the history of language study, but of any scientific field where when somebody, uh, somebody's work makes a big splash uh, and becomes controversial, um, then almost inevitably there's a falling off uh, that's the ebb tide. And it's predictable that over time, um, the things that were appreciated in that person's work will, will be revisited and, and reappreciated. So I, I think that's uh, a large part of it. I think the other thing is that the, um, the reaction against Bourdieu was also driven by a very particular context having to do with Marxism. Um, Bourdieu was, was uh, uh, Bourdieu considered himself a Marxist and he said, if Marx were writing today, he would argue against Marx. You know, he would argue, he would, he would, take, he would look for new positions and he, he was a person who looked at the world around him and took account of how the world changed. Uh, but for um, the Marxist establishment, they weren't having that. They wanted their Marx pure. Uh, and that created uh, a, a very strong rejection of Bourdieu in his native country, but also in many other parts of the world. And over the nearly 20 years since his death, um, a lot of that has changed. A lot of that has abated. And I, I think that's a part of it. But a couple of years ago appeared the Routledge, is it no? Uh, the Oxford Handbook to Bourdieu. And you know that whenever one publisher publishes a handbook of something, every other publisher does as well. So, <laughs> uh, so that's uh, part of the uh, of, of why I think there's a resurgence happening of interest in that. Thanks. Uh, and I hope a, a, re, a revisiting because. I, I meet so many people uh, who know, they know Bourdieu, they made up their mind about Bourdieu mm -hmm. years ago, and they made up their mind about, uh, no, why they, they don't want to go there. Um, and I just say to them, just just try to forget what you know and, and go back and, and reread and uh, you might be surprised. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see how this forum uh, bring people together that go or back away. Yeah. Uh, and uh, next up, there is uh, someone uh, with uh, screen name, Sari. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I suppose you. it's uh, Cecilia Gohol. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, obviously, I'm not Sari Kokomo. Not yet. Not sure I will reach that point. Anyway, so thank you very much, John, for your uh, wonderful talk. I've got one comment and one question. So regarding Bourdieu, I think we need to um, acknowledge that the ways in which uh, his work has been received in the English-speaking world has been 
influenced by the time of the translations of his books. And if you carefully look at the ways in which his books has been translated in English, it hasn't been translated in the order uh, in which yes. the books have been written. So uh, uh, that's why when you follow the order of the books that were written, actually, you see how his models develop. And actually, there is no contradictions that people have pointed out. Uh, and that, that's one of the big problems. So my, my question is about habitus. I actually uh, 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 agree with you that there is agency in the habitus. But one of the problems that people have, especially sociologists have raised about habitus is that it doesn't account for the ways in which the habitus can change social structures. Okay, so of course there is agency, but how, and if you, take habitus and apply it to language. How do you account for the fact that habitus may actually be a vector of change of language? You know? And how do you reconcile that? Um, well, I, I would say that, uh, but is, is there any less of a problem if you, uh, take a um, you know a a, a a mental grammar approach <clears throat> to knowledge of language. Does that make it easier to answer that question about how is is this not a question about is, this is is this not Saussure's problem that you know how how do we get from parole how does some all changes all language change Saussure says begins in parole happens in parole and some of them get into long through this mysterious process that no one understands uh, and no one still understands. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, I, I, I think that um, given that uh, the idea of a mental grammar has had 60 years or more, well, let's say hundred years, to try to give us the answer to that question and has failed, why mm -hmm. don't we give habitus a chance? <laughs> because, <laughs> as I say, linguists have not really used it um, much. They've not applied it much to that sort of problem. I don't know that it will uh, help with that really fundamental and intractable problem, but I, I just don't see this better than the alternative. The other thing is, I mean, you said that about that sociologists make this objection. And, you know, again, Bourdieu wasn't really a sociologist. Uh, he, um, he, he did, you know, read sociology uh, once he got appointed to a chair of it. He thought I'd better <laughs> bone up on it, but, um, but he found more things to, uh, to reject or to contest than, than to follow. And, but particularly, he, I, I think, what I find him saying is, well, before we try to answer questions, before we try to think about th social structures, before we try to really understand social structures, we need to understand ourselves, first of all. We need to look, the direction has to be from understanding the individual to understanding the social, and, that, and that's not what your average sociologist does. Yeah, no, I, I just, just as a follow up, I'm, I'm fully in favor of habitus and I've, I've been using it in my own work. I'm just trying to see what kind of limits it may have in, in us understanding language dynamics and uh, including language ideologies and stuff like that. But I'm fully in favor of the habitus. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, the uh... Uh, there's a comment from Maya, there are a couple of comments about um, colonialism. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, I, I'm puzzled by this because uh, Bourdieu's work is actually, uh, comes out of colonialism. <laughs> it's all about uh, uh, colonialism and, and particularly, uh, the, his experiences in um, uh, in Algeria, 
and, and the war in Algeria and his early work is all about that. And it figures in everything, uh, in all the work that he did in, in I, I think an outline of a theory of practice I, I, uh, I have to revisit it. I mean, Ed, Edward Said, of course, would not make a mistake like that. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> yes. Um, early work, uh, kind of, he spent some years in Algeria and wrote about the colonial context. But then, in his more, you know, prom, uh, more theoretical works around capital symbolic violence, etc., he does not really center. He does not, not only center, but doesn't really build colonialism into this, which I think might have. Um, cause, you know, been part of the cause of this reaction of distancing away from Bourdieu. He also but, had a, an interesting tension with Sanon, uh, and like there's uh -huh. him where he hates him or something. And I've recently come across some scholarship trying to resituate Bourdieu from a post-colonial, you know, perspective and talk mm -hmm. about his trajectory. Um, I'll put a reference in there that was interesting. Please, please do, yeah. Um, I just, uh, want to see here, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking up uh, my paper here, <laughs> uh, just to see, um, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to The opening, wait a minute, 1969. So um, the opening chapter of um, well, the I, I thought it was outline of theory of practice, but maybe it's another book. Um, one of his most famous books from the end of the 60s. The whole opening chapter is about colonialism and Algeria. Um, and so I'll, I'll go back and check on this and, and send you a message as well. But thanks for that reference. Um, I, uh, uh, I think the other um, thing that he does is to um, I, I think he tried, tries to show how um, a colonial mentality also exists within, how colonialism exists within the global north. And he was doing that at a time when other people weren't doing it. Um, within France, even you know between the north and the south, um, so I, I I mean my my initial reaction is that uh, this is an unfair charge that's being laid against him. But I will follow these things up and get back. Thank you. Uh, we're reaching uh, the uh, end of our talk, so I was thinking of uh, perhaps asking the three final questions, comments, uh, and then uh, you, uh, John, can select uh, how to go about them. Uh, so uh, I will start from uh, the question asked by uh, Christina, which uh, can be somewhat related to this last topic. Uh, thanks for the, this fascinating presentation. Uh, do you see the possibility of framing this discussion differently if we consider the existence of other genealogies of knowledge? For example, African, Asian, or indigenous concepts of mind or consciousness? So this would be one question and then a comment from- uh, let, let me answer that, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and, and, and hugely important, hugely important work too. Go ahead. Yes, uh, a comment uh, by Diane Larson Freeman. Uh, I think part of the problem in applied linguistics is the use of the term second language acquisition, which among other things reflects on reflects a commodification view of language. I have suggested second language development to change the uh, native speaker endpoint of the, or NS uh, endpoint of the interlanguage continuum. Uh, 
Would you like to comment? I, I, I totally agree. And uh, I, I try to do the same uh, and, and uh, sometimes um, cite, uh, cite you on that, Diane. And it, it's uh, an important thing to do. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's one of those things <clears throat> though, you know, where you've got a field that uh, is established under that name. So it's not as if you can't actually um, use the term or uh, set the term aside uh, completely. Yes, but it is habitus, and if we and if we yeah, work yeah. together, we can in fact change it. Yes. All right. All right. I, I hereby resolve that uh, <laughs> I, I will no longer use the term language acquisition. Uh, <laughs> just language I'm development. With you. But we I'm with have. You, John. Uh, Thanks for your yeah. talk. Our um, uh, master's program in that area is is the MSc in develop is in developmental linguistics, and uh, so so language development is is uh, mostly what we do, but there are some uh, journals that need renaming. Maybe, maybe that ought to be a <coughs> battlefront, second language acquisition and so on. Yes, yes. Uh, well, happy to have you join me in the campaign. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mentioned there were three interventions, but another one just came up. So there are two now. Uh, one is from uh, De Janeiro, Cindy Moya uh, Chavez, who asks, how can we understand variation within a, a language itself from your lens? Uh, um, I, I think, uh, uh, let me look for the question here. So, it's, sorry. Uh, 4.13, well, my time. 4.13. <laughs> yes, uh, it's four, 14 minutes time. ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I don't see it, but that's okay. Uh, so um, variation, language variation. And I, I think it's easier. Again, I think it's easier. I think that um, uh, sociolinguistics always struggled uh, I'll be interested to hear what Sally Coco Mufuene has to say about this. I think sociolinguistics struggled from the beginning um, with trying to reconcile itself with the intracranial um, universally based grammar uh, concept of language. And um, there's been very interesting work on uh, Lebeau's various attempts over the years to try to stay in line um, with that conception, even when some of his most prominent students were, were trying to move away from it. Um, uh, there was an article by a, a former student of mine in um, Language and Communication a couple of years ago, uh, Johannes Boschitz, uh, which I can recommend to people. It's a very good study of, of that particular uh, angle to the question. Um, I think that uh, when we're talking about, the, the, you know, variation, the word variation is like acquisition. It's a problem in itself. <laughs> Just talking about variation suggests that there is something that is core and solid, uh, you know, theme and variations that, they're, that the, the variations are not what's uh, ultimately real. And, um, and, and yet it's a tough term to get away from again. Uh, so we try to talk about variability of language um, rather than language variation. Uh, and again, I think that a move toward um, an experience-based, uh, uh, maybe distributed cognition approach to language certainly opens up new ways of thinking about what gets called language variation, new ways of analyzing it um, that get us out of some of the, uh, the corners that you get painted into when you're working from the theoretical concept of, a, of an intracranial uh, grammar. Uh, and I see a hand up. Mufane? Yes. Yeah, um, now it's Sally Corbin. <laughs> um, Jan, um, 
thank you very much for a thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, I just want to um, articulate a rejoinder to your answer about variation. I think that in social linguistics, uh, two kinds of variation have been conflated. The variation within the individual when they speak and the variation across individuals. And sometimes people try to keep the variation between the individuals clear, but there are times when people overlook the fact that variation within the individual speaker is not tantamount to variation across individuals. And if you become a dialectologist, then you add another kind of variation, variation across groups. And these are things that have been difficult to sort out. Um, and I think part of this um, is the fact that variation in social linguistics itself is predicated on the notion of communal grammar which in fact Chomsky has also conflated into one, that if you study one individual, you have studied the whole population and that is not necessarily true. And somehow somebody has to sort these things out. My own attitude has been that, um, unfortunately, this is all a consequence of linguistics being developed at the time of Newtonian physics and not at the time of uh, the theory uh, of emergence. Um, that if linguistics had developed at the time of the theory of emergence, people wouldn't have rushed to, for instance, interpret competence as system. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that you highlighted at the beginning in contrasting competence with uh, habitus. Um, but that then that would take me again to the question that the comment that Cecile uh, made and, and, and you answered it adequately, whether if you substitute one term to another, you would explain why things happen. And Chansky has not told us how competence develops <laughs> and that you deal with habitus and habitus Bourdieu didn't have to explain. <laughs> Uh, how habitus develop. And you read Chomsky, you wonder whether Chomsky really meant that it must be constant, immutable. And the same question arises with habitus. Does it have to be constant, immutable? And these are open questions. And I, I think that the more we pay attention to the theory, to theories of emergence, the more we realize that these notions can be um, questioned and, and, and re-articulated differently. And maybe there is a way of bridging them. I don't know. Uh, uh, because people focus on different facets of language and they talk about, they emphasize some aspects of language, but not all relevant aspects of language. Uh, but that's the contribution I want to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I would just say that I, on that, that one question, I mean, uh, Bourdieu is very clear that habitus is not constant, that habitus changes as we go through life, even if there is a sort of intense period of sedimentation early on. Whereas with Chomsky, you know, you, you, you're a native speaker from the age of four, and anything that happens thereafter is trivial. So there, there is, a, I think, a big difference there. Uh, maybe it's a difference of degree rather than kind, but it is a difference. Well, my take is that um, the competence that you develop as a child and you make, make, makes you a native speaker of a language um, must differ from the competence that a person develops in a language as an adult, because if you already speak, you as, speak a particular language, when you learn the next language, there are transfers that you make from the previous language, and it's not going to be the same thing. But what Chomsky didn't factor in at that time 
or it didn't talk about, first of all, if you acquire two languages at this concurrently, you are a native speaker of two, are the systems separate? That's another one, that, another issue that you brought up, or do they overlap? And my hunch is that if the time, at the time people discuss these issues, uh, instead of doing linguistics on paper, they have done linguistics on computer, then people could have thought of a tagging system, the same system, but you have tags that tell you this goes with this domain, this goes with this other domain, this goes with you're talking to this individual and things like that. So we, th th these are things that we really um, haven't uh, revisited well enough to be able to take a clear position from them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, and as we are uh, passing the, uh, a great time and phasing into our uh, after parties, there are just two more uh, questions. Uh, I face this dilemma all the time uh, chairing the discussions because the discussions <laughs> get richer and richer. And uh, I can stop it now, sorry. Uh, so uh, there is uh, Ashraf who would like to ask a question himself and also uh, Desmond Odugu who asked if you could uh, say more about Christina Severo's question about other genealogies of knowledge. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Jim Joseph, for this very interesting presentation. I remember when I was doing my PhD under the supervision of uh, John, uh, I was met with a dilemma uh, because I was working on the notion of, uh, uh, I was analyzing a language policy in the Sudanese context, and I was met with a contradiction. How how to deal with the notion of language rights without falling into the sensuous trap of the native speaker. And I remember uh, John directed me to a way uh, which was very productive, uh, it, which was that, yes, you can think about language rights without, without, without using the notion, the notion of the native speaker as a reference, a standard reference, but you can, you can think or you can rethink uh, the notion of language rights from the perspective of the habitus. And that idea actually was, uh, you know, a turning point because uh, I ended up with a different understanding of uh, uh, the notion of language rights. Thinking about the notion of language rights from the perspective of habitus is a very interesting way of de-essentializing the link between language and um, ethnicity, particularly in context of conflict. So that, so I, sh I should have said, and in that context, I met uh, the radical militant, militant guy, Simfrey, <laughs> in that context, <laughs> uh, uh, I remember. So um, I also find uh, the, um, a, another contradiction which is solved by, uh, uh, by John's suggestion that, you know, uh, we can, we can uh, de-link the notion of native speaker from the individual's mind, linking to the individual mind to, and relinking it to the notion of social practice experience. I think if we think about the, native, the notion of native speaker in that way, we can solve many contradictions outside the, the paradigm, of the Western, Western theory, for example, in the context of art tradition. The native speaker there is, is not oppressive at all. Uh, it's tied to social practice. In fact, the, in Arabic uh, classical tradition, the, 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 the term itself, native speaker, doesn't exist. <clears throat> it doesn't have the, it's not there at all. Mm -hmm. And the standard language itself was constructed by non-native speakers. Persian, Sivoy, for example, was a Persian guy. And he's now the standard reference. So if you say to someone from the, you know, from the Arab world, you're not a native speaker of standard Arabic, you might be kicked on the ground. <laughs> because it's, it's one of the cultural tools of resistance, you know, imperialism and so on. So these, they, they view standard Arabic as their native language. So you see now, the, use, the, looking at the notion of native speak from the perspective of habitus, perspective of body experience, can solve that contradiction in a different context. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, Ashraf, and, and I agree, and that's very, 
enlightening and and i i just wouldn't go so far as to say it solves it <laughs> solves it but but offers a you know a path uh out of that trap Thank you. And then before passing on uh, the word to Makone to uh, wrap up the conversation, Desmond, would you like to? Uh, yes, there was, uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry. And, and uh, was it Christine who uh, someone yes. said that yes. you wanted me to say more about um, mm -hmm. framing the discussion differently if we consider the existence of other genealogies of knowledge, Africans? Um, yes. uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, again, the, the answer is absolutely yes. I do. Uh, um, I had, I, I do some uh, of that in my book. I don't do as much as I would have liked to do. Um, uh, and, and there's a lot to be done. Uh, and I'm trying to, you know, uh, when students look for projects to do, this is the sort of thing, the sort of direction um, that I push them into, uh, particularly if they come already with the, um, the knowledge of the, you know, genealogies uh, in, in question. It's not something that you can pick up um, easily uh, or readily. And my own is, uh, you know, I, I have a smattering of knowledge in some of these areas and not I think enough to do serious work um, in uh, on on the African Asian indigenous um, concepts of mind and consciousness uh, that needs to be done. Uh, and and uh, I you know I when work appears uh, that is doing that uh, I. Uh, am, delighted and to take the first opportunity uh, to look at it. And, and there is some uh, work of that nature in the, uh, not only the book uh, Sinfree is co-editing to which I contributed the preface, but the other um, three, 300 books that Sinfree is uh, co-editing or writing at the moment. Um, so the work you're doing uh, Sinfree is I think um, contributing hugely in that regard. Uh, but I, I think that I'm being asked to give an example <laughs> of, of, uh, of something. And um, uh, and I would like somebody else to do that for me who, who is more, more qualified, more, more deeply knowledgeable of, of this to give me an example of uh, how an African or Asian or other indigenous concept of mind and consciousness could uh, help us in reframing this question in these questions in another way. Did you raise your hand, Desmond? No, okay. okay. Desmond, do you want to ask your last question then I can wrap up and then Kim can make announcements about the next session. There is no additional question here. Uh, thank you, Professor Joseph, um, uh, for reawakening my early sojourns in philosophy. Um, so this is uh, interesting. Thank you. I saw that Sangeeta raised her hand. Yes. Okay, Sangeeta. Well, it, it was, uh, I thought I was the last one on the planet to have learned that uh, in Sanskrit, there is a word, and I've forgotten it, so this is a big apology, but this is what you do when you say mind. Oh, I see. And I just, uh, so, I mean, I, I was thinking of that when you were talking of the, and you know, how cognitively we are framed. And this is the mind. So, so uh -huh. that, that also helps you kind of trouble the, the very essentialistic and Eurocentric way of understanding the, the, uh, the dissociation between mind and body. Mm. But uh, I'm, I'm not an expert. I just came across this uh, a couple of months ago and I thought that was very enlightening. It, it also, I, I mean, this is in my book as well, but it's also part of the, um, uh, the Greek uh, tradition as well because uh, Aristotle, whose father was a physician and Aristotle himself uh, took part in 
um, as uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of anatomical dissections uh, of uh, not only human corpses but of living animals, vivisections, you know, to see the operation of the body. And through all of that experience, Aristotle determined that the uh, mind is located in the heart. Plato, who never had any medical knowledge whatsoever, never saw inside a human body, uh, determined that the mind is um, in the brain. Um, and people found that hard to believe because the brain is a cold organ. They, uh, Aristotle's reasoning was that the heart, because it is warm and sends fluid throughout the body, uh, the heart must therefore be the mind, it must be the center of it all, where the things that we think or we desire then get translated into muscular action. Um, the brain has fluid in it, but it's all contained uh, and so on. But it's, it's, uh, it's ironic that um, then the Western tradition, both medical and uh, philosophical decided at some point uh, about uh, not quite 2000 years ago that it, it is the brain. Right. Okay. Um, Janira, are you still there or I can just sum up? Okay. This is uh, what we are going to be doing uh, moving forward. The first five sessions by Chris Hutton, John Bowie, Monica Heller, and Bonnie McQueenie, and Kwesi Pra are going to appear in a volume that we have uh, edited, published by Multilingual Matters. So uh, as far as the publication of this series is concerned, we are just starting. So at least we, we now have one volume that we are going to be heading over to multilingual matters at the end of the month. Then we'll move on to another set. So that uh, ultimately you will have the YouTubes, you will have the transcripts, and you have the volumes from all these conversations. Then we also have um, a series of books that are coming out soon. There's um, a handbook on language and the global south that is more or less complete now. Uh, we're just waiting for Bonaventura Dos Santos and my other friend, Anna Demati to write the concluding note and the, uh, and the preface, but we've got most of the chapters ready. And a couple of other um, uh, projects that were, that are more or less finished, for example, Anna DeMartin myself have finished now another volume called, I can't remember the title, I know it might be uh, Decolonizing Sociolinguistics, uh, which is more or less finished. So in a sense, there's going to be quite a bit of reading that is coming out from all these activities. And I must say that um, it has really been exciting to work on all these projects and to engage with, uh, with all of you. John, thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody else for their participation. So I must give over to Kim um, Hansen to make the announcement. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to Dr.